Well, welcome, Merrick, to the show. Um, once again, always, always love to talk to you. Um, I was uh, recently approached by your uh, agent, your uh, unofficial agent. My, my uh, manager. Your manager. <laughs> Your your content your content uh, uh, entrepreneurial expert or whatever uh, because I I have heard there's been a a, a particularly intense flare up of um, weird swerfy sex worker phobia bullshit on the online left that you have largely been the recipient of um, but not the only recipient but one of the major recipients of so I figured we it would do us all some good to discuss that. Um, and anything else that you wish to discuss um, with related topics. We've had um, a lot of people wanting me to have you on to talk about sex work, to talk about sex workers' issues and, and things like that. And I figured this would be an awesome opportunity to do so. So um, welcome once again to the show. Always, always love having you on. And uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. So yeah, give us the give us the rundown. What's been going on and and uh, and what are your thoughts on it? Oh, man. So some of you will probably have seen the more recent stuff, but um, I guess, and I do feel a little bit bad about this, but um, someone made um, like a, an image of nine different leftists that they put together. And they said, um, if you, or it was like a, a picture of nine of us and it was like, these people are like anti-black or they're not your friends if you're black or brown or something like that. Um, and I was thrown on there. And so when I saw it, I was just like, yeah, okay, whatever. It's like, this is the usual kind of shit that people make about and like throw me in it. Uh, was right. Vosh in it? Yeah, Vosh was in it. Vosh was in it um, too, yeah. Yeah, it was like me, Aiden, Vosh, uh, I don't know, so, some other people. But there was this girl on there who is um, like an ultra far lefty tanky type. Um, oh. And she's someone who has been she's been like hate posting about me for months and months and months for like a really long time. Um, and it, yeah, it was basically just like a list of like bad white lefties. <laughs> um, and so like I, for the longest time, I just ignored it. I didn't care, whatever. Um, and then I guess somebody asked me, they sent me her picture and they were like, uh, do you think that she'll chop my head off? She's kind of cute though. It was some lib saying this to me, like <laughs> making a joke, like making like a like a really bad horny, like down so bad meme. Um, and I feel bad because I was like, well, she's pretty fucking crazy. She'll probably chop your head off, bud. Don't you worry. <laughs> Wish probably would be granted. The old, and, the um, old praying mantis approach. Yeah, the, the praying the mantis kick. You know, you know. Praying you, mantis approach. You, you bang yeah. and then snip right off. Just... There you go. Yeah, and and so I should have just kept my mouth shut. Um, this is someone who has been like going after me for a very long time, um, like to the point where I think my husband blocked them in my phone like months and months and months ago, and like doesn't let me see the things they say about me because it's so nasty and That's she's fair. just like yeah. so mean spirited. So you know I shouldn't have said anything. I should have just taken the high road and kept my mouth shut. But I guess. Um, someone showed her that I said that so she decided that she was going to go to my mini vids and start taking screenshots of my porn previews holy um, shit and that she was going to post those porn previews all over twitter um and talk like really sexually about my husband um, that she was going to sexually harass my husband and, like, spread my porn around, basically, to, like, get back at me because I said that she acts kind of crazy. Um, wow. Uh, so, yeah. Ama so absolutely incredible, incredible logic leap from, um, you know, I want to prove I'm the best leftist around, so I'm going to basically do, like, a pseudo-revenge porn by stealing preview images and reposting them without accreditation and using them to drum up further hate against somebody amazing yeah, logic she was like photoshopping me out of them and like photoshopping herself into them to be like um i'm fucking your husband like your husband said like just like and saying nasty shit like your husband told me that you're fucking disgusting like it just all kinds of like stuff that i don't want to repeat um like insulting my body like that sort of thing and just like talking obsessively about having sex with my husband and he was so fucking uncomfortable and like so weirded out it like actually 
sexually harassing my partner. Um, That's incredibly like, weird. Yeah, it's really, really, really weird. And so I guess there's a circle of leftists who do this to me a lot where they uh, they post my porn. Um, so this is like not a new thing. But it, I think it's the first time that someone whose name or face is attached to their account that's done it. Usually it's just like tanky shit posters that'll do it. Um, 5K, hammer and sickle in bio, anonymous account. Yeah. The, the, yeah. We all know that we all know the drill on that one. Yep. yep. Yeah. So this is pretty normal stuff. Um, but it, it, she just like took it a step further and like photoshopped herself into it and was like making multiple memes of it and like kept reposting it, I guess. Like I saw at least two of them that she posted, which is very, very, very weird. Um, and I think so it started to get a lot of traction. Um, and I just saw like a ton of it was really funny. Like, I guess people actually did call her out for it, which is cool. Um, I That's wish good. that it had been called start. out in the past, but mm. cause again, this is like definitely not the first time. This isn't even the worst that's happened. Like I've had people Photoshop, like all kinds of slurs, um, over like, like take f the, my, my previews and then like post them on like where it looks like it's on Pornhub. So they're like, I ripped your thing and I posted it on Pornhub and like trying to make me think that they're like basically stealing my content and i guess now um there's a guy named dsa racist or he goes by neat or whatever and he's been really 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 antagonistic to me yeah that was um, one of the guys who was pushing the nashville stuff i remember a yeah lot, a lot of yeah. receipts from that account they seem to be a particularly yep. mal malignant figure yeah so he has been posting i guess uh, my husband was telling me, so I, I haven't been watching this stuff because, like, I can't watch this stuff. I can't see it go down in person because it just makes Good me move, yeah. fucking sick. Yeah, like, so my husband was telling me that I guess they've been posting uh, links to sites where my content is ripped. So they're trying to make sure that as many people as possible get my content for free. And they're trying to boost it and get it out there. Um, because Literally they want just people... trying to destroy your career is what you're saying. Yeah, ba yeah. well, basically, yeah. Yeah. Um, or, like... I, I don't know like it's it's been a lot um but so i've seen a lot of people uh boosting it i've seen a lot of people saying fuck her she deserves this this is fine it's not revenge porn um she's a sex worker she put it out there on a on many vids so it's basically this is like public free for all for anyone who wants to do anything with it which is not true <laughs> um you still can't use my content in a way that i don't consent to um absolutely so, that's like completely you're right like what the fuck is yeah. wrong with these people so i don't know if i don't know if it technically falls under the category of revenge porn yeah. um but the the whole idea behind revenge porn is that you take images of someone that they may or may not know exist and you spread them around um with the express purpose of either humiliating or intimidating or blackmailing or, or whatever with mm -hmm. them um, and so, you know, obviously the intent here is to steal money from me, to make sure that I can't take care of myself, to try and take customers away from me, to, hurt to try and get my content out for free, to hurt me, to go after my, you know, anyone who appears in my content, um, to go after my, my husband, because they know that a lot of it is filmed with my husband. Um, and, you know, it's to, to humiliate and embarrass me. Yeah, it's, it's to hurt me. So it's, it's the same idea. Um, and it's, there was like, I guess some, some debates going on about whether what happened to me was okay or not. Um, and Deba debates like, <laughs> <laughs> like whether What's like a bunch of people being like, it's not revenge for it. It's fine. Like she, oh, put this oh up yeah. Herself. I love that. I love, I love, yeah. uh, what, what, what was the, what's the, the term that was coined by, by infrared, uh, definition mongering. You know, isn't that kind of the, 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 the core example of that? The uh, definition mongering is when it's like, well, it's not technically revenge porn. So that means that it's OK. Well, it's like, no, you're actually still causing harm. You're advancing anti-sex worker sentiment. You're, you're directly targeting someone. You're filling their life with harassment. Those are all pretty bad things. And your justification for this is the vague idea, a rumor that you're anti-black or something based on a certain interpretation of some tweet from months and months ago. It's um pretty weird. I, think they, I don't even think they think I'm anti-black because of anything I've tweeted. They think I'm anti-black because I uh, didn't agree with Kunta J and then because I called him out for lying twice with like screenshots of his own tweets.
that's why they say I'm anti-black because Kunta so, J is a black man. So therefore, because I didn't agree with him, I was doing anti-black harassment. That's ah, literally where that comes from. That's the whole thing. I see. So yeah, the way it works is if if somebody who belongs to a minority group harasses you and you push back, then that means you're against every member of that group. You know, you know that sounds to so, me yeah. a little bit like somebody is trying to weaponize a marginalized group of people for their own self enrichment. You know, that's that's kind of what that makes me um, think of. You know, it's very weird. Yeah, it's, I find that a very weird tactic that people use. It's yeah. pretty cynical. Um, it's it's I mean it's literally weaponized id pool, but yeah. Um, yeah I don't know the whole situation was really weird because um, so there were the people who were like no this is fine if you put it out there herself but then there were also like <laughs> I saw so many threads of girls and sex workers being like it doesn't matter how evil and awful and trash a person Merrick is fuck her she's awful but it's still not okay to do this and I was just like oh my god well... reading these being like. This is such a fucking. Situation. It it is actually it's actually unbelievable how like uh uh how how hating you has become like an an an, an inter an like inter signal. like m particularly in the ML space it's like an inter ML virtue signal that yeah it's like oh like even even if like I need to just express how much I hate Merrick even though I'm gonna denounce this action that's very very like it's very fucked. If you like, I I don't know. Like, isn't this kind of like I don't know. I I feel like your experience online, especially specifically on Twitter, has been like a a a speed run, like uh example of the cancellation cycle of how previous cancellations justify future cancellations with in which increase in intensity, and each time there's just an increasing snowball of unbelievable claims that are made against you with no receipts for those things. And then if anybody ever asks for receipts, it, it might take them hours to sift through them all. And it's – so for half the or, people – yeah. Well, or it's it's she's not going to fuck you. That's the one that comes out a lot too. She's not going to fuck you, bro. Nice. Or you're a simp. And you're like – Cool and misogyny based, I guess. <laughs> like, yeah, nice, right? Yeah, I don't yeah. know. It's it's very it's very weird because um, I I struggle with this because like I don't want to be someone who um, takes criticism and just goes, well, all of this criticism is happening because I'm a woman, or all of this criticism is happening because I'm a sex worker, because I feel like that's the exact same thing that we don't want and that we were just talking about right like that yeah, in itself yeah. would also be weaponized in, in pool which i don't want to do because I, I don't think that that's productive and because i do think that people have actual criticisms of me um and i do think that i have done things that were insensitive like i was thinking about this um the other day when all of this stuff was happening and all of these people were like um all of these girls were talking about like it doesn't matter how fucking disgusting she is how she's the worst person on this website and i was like man what have i really genuinely done that i legitimately look back on and like feel bad for or think was a bad thing because i've been so built up into this evil person and you know i thought about it and i was like man i really don't feel like i handled the india thing well like i really should have dealt with that better so i do think that there are legitimate criticisms of my behavior and my actions but it just feels like so much of that criticism gets bogged down in <sighs> in my personal opinion i don't think you've done anything uh that even comes close to the magnitude of frustration and and, and anger and hatred that comes your way like uh this is something that i i have uh you know with my galactic sized ego apparently um have stated about myself which is that um the re the the recourse for any perceived wrongdoing that i've done in my with my own career online is is not in step with what whatever they even accused so even if i did w do what they accused and 99 percent of the time i have not um the amount of of anger and hatred that comes back at you isn't even in step I, i've dealt with this with the whole cancellation situation i dealt with and i think it's especially true in your case i think it's more true for you than it is even for myself and i've dealt with a lot of controversy and hatred online um 
I mean, if it's constant pressure, but for you, it's like, I don't know. So you made a slightly insensitive addition to your giant informative thread. Okay. All right. If you want to say that's a bad thing, then the worst thing it gets is a couple people going, Ooh, bad luck, bad luck, hun. Like that's what it should be. That's what it should. That's where it should end is a couple people going bad luck. Instead it's become, uh, it's become a months long saga of you being harassed as some kind of racist anti-leftist CIA agent terrorist. Who's like, it's unbelievable. And, and, and I know that like, I, I, I sympathize greatly with, with the urge to like, always find what, like to steel man, the position of your opponents, because I mean, God knows, my viewers know that I've done, like, literally hours of on-screen critique in an attempt to try and, like, meet in good faith the, the, the many, many myriad critiques against me. But I don't, like, but I think that sometimes, like, that's almost an overcompensation on our own part. Like, these people aren't engaging in good faith. They're not treating you kindly. They're using you as a as a scapegoat for whatever frustrate political frustrations and angers they have they can signal to their friends and and have a nice little bullying party where they all get to you know throw stones at the person that they don't like today and i just i just i can understand the urge to want to like find what you did wrong but at the same time like i just really don't think um that there's anything that even amounts to close to the hate that you've received online. Like, it's just, I, I, I've, I struggle to think of anybody in our spaces who gets as much just raw bullshit, like air puffed hate as you do. I mean that. So yeah. Thank you. I, you know, I, it's really nice to hear people say that because, you know, I think that one of the reasons why I respect you so much is that you do a lot of self-crit and not only do you do self-crit but you do it publicly um and i've definitely seen um i've seen you do streams that are like many 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 hours long and it's not like oh you have one person on or you have two people on i remember the first day it was like after your uh uh dgg stuff you had like 11 people or something come on like you had most so of them other people. content creators not even yeah. just random viewers just content creators who came on to well, listen, I don't want to, a lot of them well, didn't, didn't actually watch the whole thing. So, um, yeah, but, sure. but um, yeah. but, but I, I, you know, that's, that's something that I, I respect about you a lot. And because I think that those are values that we share, right? Like I never want to be someone who's like, I didn't do anything wrong. These people are just mean to me, yeah. but it's, it's very hard to, um, it's very hard to sort through, I think, what is the good faith criticism when so much of it is like at this point so much of it has like um boiled down into like body shaming and, yeah i saw that with um, fucking peter coffin i don't know if you saw my segment i did on that but uh i had a little fun okay listen i chose war alongside you so just know that whether you knew it or not there was some uh that segment just went up today so if you want to go take a look at it uh i i uh <laughs> I might have taken a few, uh, I might have, let's just say I helped, I helped Peter do another ball kick. Okay. Let's put it that way. All right. Listen, I'm not a big fan of, uh, Peter Coffin and his, uh, his shitty, uh, like w whatever he thinks passes for humor, which is just like pathetic. So being, yeah. it just kind of seems like it's being a dick. Um, yeah. but yeah, so th this is, this is the thing that is so crazy to me is that there's like become so much fixation on like what I look like, yeah. um, or there's become so much fixation on this idea that I'm like not actually fuckable or something. And it just, it's so fucking bizarre to me because, um, it, there are other large lefty girls that have done really similar things and that post really similar content to me nobody goes after them like i i don't know um it, it does seem like a lot of it stems from the fact that my job is sex work so it just seems like the good way to hurt me is to try to signal that i'm a bad sex worker because i'm not fuckable because i'm a bad person so therefore i'm also ugly or something like i 
I don't I don't know. It's it's really hard to like. Yeah, I don't the think there's a logic to it. I think it's just sort of like just raw emotional venting of 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 anger, right? Like I don't think there's like a whole lot of logic to it. I think sometimes there's some sort of post hoc logic that tries to be applied, but I don't think this is like a rational process. I think this is people that see that um, hating you tends to get a lot of follows because there are a couple of people out there who really hate you and will boost that sort of stuff. Um, and also, I'm gonna go there and I'm gonna say that like the ML portion of Twitter has a huge has like a big problem with anti sex worker rhetoric. Like I just saw a thread retweeted with a lot of attention the other day that was talking about how good comrades shouldn't participate in the sex trades. They shouldn't partake in the sex trades. Like, does anybody did anybody else see that thread going about? Like that's pretty uh that's a pretty questionable little uh, regressive reactionary approach there, isn't it? Oh, I have no problem with sex workers, but a good upstanding comrade would focus themselves, um, would focus their masculine energies on investing in the revolution and not in sex workers. You know what that sounds like? It sounds literally indistinguishable from my pastor in the cult that I grew up in preaching about how men should in, shouldn't indulge in sexual impurity because they need to lead their families on the path to God. They should be devoting themselves to God. No difference to me. Like I see no difference in that side of type of rhetoric. You know, I think that there's this sentiment as well um, that, excuse me, that, um, all sex work is in person full service done by survival workers or done by women who are trafficked mm -hmm. um and that if you are partaking in any kind of sex work it's you're just going to be like actually physically fucking a vulnerable woman like that's kind of how it gets talked about which is not really reflective of reality um so I guess I just want to make this really clear because um, whenever we talk about sex work, I think it's really important that we are able to make um, distinctions. Mm -hmm. And and I know not that not everyone knows this. So so sex work is an umbrella term, and there's a lot of things that fall under sex work, and that would be things like full service, which is what people generally think of, um, porn, exotic dancers. Um, people who run like phone sex stuff. Um, and, and by porn, that's like, that's industry porn, that's homemade porn, um, camming, lewd cosplay of sex work. Yeah, I would agree with that. Lewd cosplay of sex work. Uh, girls who make their money off of like lewds. There's, there's a huge, um, girl. She, she looks like Shu. Her name is, um, Kiwi Sunset. She's a huge sex worker. Um, I, know. And she, I, I know she is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She um, doesn't even post nudes, I don't think. I think she posts, like, lewds and implied. Um, and that's still sex work. Mm -hmm. So this idea that if that to be a good communist, you don't uh, participate or you don't buy from sex workers or you don't... Um, contribute to the industry i feel like it's just very kind of regressive and it just shows a lack of understanding of the actual industry and i do feel like a lot of leftists that talk about that are in those spheres in particular that talk about sex work talk about it in a way that tells me um that they don't really know very much about it yeah. Um, and that you're right, it is sort of this like almost knee jerk reactionary understanding of it. And just like, I think a lot of it is like a good hearted desire to, to take care of people. Um, but there are many, many ways in which you can take care of sex workers by actually engaging in with their content and by being respectful to them oh, and by helping them pay their bills. Because this idea that, um, helping the proletariat by boycotting some of the most vulnerable proletarians thank you that's a, that comment is incredible that sums up what i was about to say yeah. you're not helping us by denying us the resources that we need to live you're and when you try to get other people to deny us the resources we need to live you're hurting us all over again um so yeah, I think you're right. I think that there are definitely um, almost religious-like 
elements to the way that they approach sex work. And I think it's yeah. like pretty, it seems pretty widely misunderstood by that crowd. Um, and if you start talking about things like this and you say, Hey, there is voluntary stuff. Um, it turns into, well, you know, y'all, y'all are the, those of you who, who are voluntary sex workers are the most privileged. And it's like, okay, no one was disputing that. Sure. But that doesn't change the fact that there are definitely lots of um, voluntary workers and there's lots of voluntary material out there. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it, I think I'm a little less charitable these days than than perhaps you are um, about the way the, the motivations. I don't necessarily believe that this comes from a like a particularly good place. I think it comes from a lack of um, like a like an ignorance and a lack of um of like challenging misogynist stereotypes i think that a lot of um there are a lot of people who like um particularly who are on the very 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 class focused side of the left i'm talking the class reductionists the mls these people who you know they love that shit um and i think that those people um they don't they they have a vision of like um a very like night early 1900s type of communism that was highly exclusionary to women um and that often only paid lip service to the the revolutionary value of women um and i think that uh they see the sex trade as predominantly a women's industry and therefore they carry with all of the uh, with their with the aesthetic that they try to live up to of this old style steel workers and you know holding big wrenches and whatever um like that type of image that they unintentionally digest and 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 like internalize a lot of the misogyny that was present at those times um and uh it's 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 really frustrating uh to me to see because like i think it completely like it, it undermines it undermines multiple intersections of 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 uh of of the leftist like spectrum like not only is it does it undermine like women by participating in 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 misogyny it specifically focuses on undermining sex workers who of all stripes are in a particularly pr precarious position in our society but it also undermines specifically trans people who have a really 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 high rate of being sex workers for some or all of their life and like i mean like to the degree that like for me being somebody i'm trans and I mean, while I never did any sort of full service or I've never done any cam stuff, I have, you know, I've wrote for commission a lot of stuff. Um, I did a lot of role plays and stuff like that uh, in the past um, for money. And so and, and almost every like nearly every trans person I know, um, specifically trans women, have either at one point engaged in or are currently engaged in some level of sex work. And so for me, it's like, how can you even, how can you take a position like this? You're undermining multiple facts, huge and important and, and, and segments of the left that we need to have solidarity with. So it's a position that really confuses, uh, that really confuses me. And, um, and I don't know, I, I can't help but find myself fighting, you know, fighting against, wanting to fight against it and, and wondering why it's permitted so much among certain um, factions online. Well, you know, uh, you raise a really good point. Um, and it's not, it's not just, uh, like white trans women either. This affects a lot of women of color too, which I think is something that's not often, or uh, not talked about enough. Cause, um, you know, when you do talk about sex work with someone who has, you know, even a passing knowledge of the subject, you do often, you know, unfortunately have to bring up the fact that like a ton of trans women feel almost like they have to do sex work at some points because 100%. I mean, yeah. so I was, I don't know if, if you guys know this, but, um, I was with a trans woman on and off for four years. We dated for a very long time. We lived together. And when I was with her, when she was transitioning before she had come out to anyone else, one of the biggest things that she was scared of was that she was going to lose her job. And she was like, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if they're going to let me stay on. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And if they don't let me stay on, is someone else going to want to hire me? Like, what am I going to do? Um, and so there's a ton of, unfortunately, there's a ton of trans women who find themselves in this position where they're like, well, I know something I can do. Um, and it's also a lot of women of color. Um, yes, it and is. Yep. There's, 
Yeah, I mean, there's just like there's so many people who um, there's also so many people who've done sex work who like don't tell other people and who don't talk about it. Invisible. And yep. when you yeah, when you like go on the timeline and you kind of like talk about them like they're victims or you kind of talk down about it or even if you don't explicitly state that you you don't have to explicitly state I think that this is a gross job and I think that the women who are doing it are victims who aren't in control of their own lives or who can't lead their own lives or who, you know, need to be saved. You don't have to be explicit about it. When you have that feeling about it, it comes out in the way you talk about it. Like we're not yeah, stupid. It's patronizing. We can figure it out. It's super yeah, it's patronizing. It's extremely patronizing. Yeah. yeah. It's like there's um, like in the in the rhetoric, there's like this attempt to strip agency. And while there are absolutely I mean, traffic trafficking is a huge problem but 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 conflating those two all the time and using rhetoric that conflates those two is insulting to both you know like it's like it 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 undermines the seriousness of what conditions lead people to become to become the victims of trafficking and it also undermines the conditions that that lead people to choose sex work as a viable path if it is a viable path for them and it and it it, it like almost like smooths over all the nuance to make like an easily digestible narrative that just clicks right into those old uh like christian misogynist sensibilities of like ah look at you're just you know isn't it terrible that our pure communist revolutionary women are having to spread their legs for the capitalist bourgeois who oh it's like oh god it's like it like it like touches on all of those same fucking uh reactionary tendencies it's so frustrating to me this was actually something that um and it's funny because we're we're gonna loop it back to to coffin for a second here um when i basically was like um hey i think in a post-capitalist society there would still be people who wanted to engage in activities that today we consider to be sex work um and i don't think that it would be right to like call that pity sex and i think that that still would need to be recognized as a form of like generosity and emotional labor um and everyone freaked out because i gave it a silly name peter coffin had someone on their podcast and this girl claims she was a former sex worker. I, I don't know. Um, okay. But so she works with uh, a lot of like rescue anti-human trafficking organizations that are interesting, I suppose, when it comes to what their agenda seem to be. But so they had her on their podcast to talk about me. And basically, she said the idea that I was what I was talking about that, um, that there are some people who are interested in and in that see um, sexual services as kind of like a necessary part of, I don't know, having a healthy society. Yeah. Um, that that is an idea that comes from or enables i guess uh proletarian women's bodies to be given to the elites and the upper classes or something like that i don't know it was a very very weird um little tangent that they they went off on mm. Um, but it, it, yeah, it's it's stuff like that that kind of like strips our agency away from us. Yeah. Um, and it also and plays on these tropes that like, oh, women aren't actual sexual agents. Like they don't want to have sex unless uh, unless they're made to. It's like this, it, it has all of these compounding like uh, again, it's just playing on tropes that already existed. And and like I recognize that nobody can be you know, nobody can completely eliminate all prejudice and whatever from them but it's weird when you get to the point of where you're advocating for things and you haven't really taken the time to challenge you know what preconceptions you might have that might be incorrect especially when it it is it is so out of step with the reality of it um like i mean hell like i can imagine like hell i think i would be more likely to go back to the work that i used to do um you know where like where i engaged with with people uh through role play or through writing through being commissioned for specific like you know kink stuff um i think i would be more likely to do that in a society where there wasn't any monetary pressure part of the reason why i burned down on it even though i really loved doing that um was because 
the money was so stressful. The money, the money situation was always on my mind and I needed to do, be doing so much extra work that I burned out on my passion for writing altogether. Well, not altogether, but a lot. I haven't, you know, and so I don't know, like I can see myself being more comfortable with that. So I don't understand how that became a hot take outside of people finding a post hoc rational rationalization to hate on a woman on the internet who's a sex worker, just like all of the generations of people have done before them. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting about this um, because I didn't think that my take was really all that spicy at all. And I know that this is something that we we have talked about before, yeah, but have, yeah. um, like even if you look at r slash gone wild, mm -hmm. it literally already exists that people will provide nudes for free. Yeah. Now, are those people doing it because they feel like people need free accessible porn and because it's good to have a society that has access to sexual aids? No, probably not. Most of them, most of them are probably doing it because it's like a kink thing or they yeah, think it's hot. Yeah, exhibitionists or whatever, yeah. I mean, like exhibitionists or whatever. Um, but I, I don't think Of which there that, are like, a lot. There are a lot, as it turns out. There anyway, are a lot sorry. of exhibitionists. It's true. Yes. Um, but yeah, like I just, I think it's really, really silly to pretend like this doesn't exist yeah. um, or to pretend like it's a negative thing. And I think the more time we spend talking about like, is the sex industry bad or not? Um, we, it's sort of a pointless discussion because the discussion should be what aspects of the sex industry are bad and how do we change them right now? How do we fix them to make them better? How do we make them safer? Like if you want to talk about, um, and like people will be like, well, you know, you're just a, a white middle-class lady. Of course, sex work isn't difficult for you. And it's like, okay, well, if you just would actually like listen when we're trying to talk about it, you would understand that some of my concerns about the sex industry are like FOSTA and SESTA and how that makes it harder to find actually trafficked women. Yeah. Or you would know that like some of my concerns about the industry are um, you almost never see down in Texas. Um, <clears throat> you, you will sometimes in Austin, you'll see clubs that are like racially mixed. Like mm -hmm. my first home club was like that. It was really cool. They would accept all kinds of body types. You could have tattoos. You could have different colored hair. You mm -hmm. didn't have to be super fit. You could be black. But it's a huge problem in the industry that there's – the industry is like racially segregated. And this is not something that I often hear a lot of people who are not strippers um, talking about. So mm -hmm. like if you are so worried about how the sex industry is so damaging, like you're not going to shut down strip clubs. You're not going to like do right. away with the strip club industry. Industry, but I don't hear people who think sex work is so bad ever talking about that. Like the fact that there's an enormous degree of racial segregation, like you have black booty clubs and then you have white gentlemen's clubs. And sometimes they even have racial hiring quotas Jesus. where it's like, and if you're a black girl, unless you're like a fucking a nine out of 10, like you're not going to get hired. Um, and so it's like fucked. all these people who are like sex work is bad and sex work is exploitative and it's this, that, and the other, like, well, okay, but, like, do you even know what any of the specific issues with our industry are? No. Because, like, I, I do, and other strippers do, but I don't see, like, our voices being boosted about this sort of thing. And so it's, like, it can be really, really frustrating to see people on the outside have these conversations. Yeah. Because And interestingly, it it's, a it's often a lot of men who've never even t come close to the, to the sex work industry uh denouncing and uh and 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 being real loud and 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 denouncing women who are actually talking about their experiences with said industry and it reeks of puritanism to me it reeks of this disordered uh disordered connection specifically here in america you know i mostly deal in Mar american politics i'm sure there's a lot of nuance in other countries but here in america there's this puritanical air to all discussions of sex work that ultimately has these like hard to see sometimes veil thinly veiled um assumptions about like like the personalities of people who would do uh sex work the personalities of people who would want to run a club the personalities of people who would want to pay and all of this nonsense and i i find that to be a, a deeply offensive approach that's shockingly co like common uh, at least in the online left oh yeah yeah, exactly. Um, like this idea of shaming men for 
wanting to engage in sex work, I think is really, really damaging. Um, and, and this is oh, something that like, so I've been I've been accused of like bringing sex pests into online spaces and like making other women unsafe. But I don't think that being sexually open is what encourages people to be sex pests. And I don't think utilizing a sex worker services is what makes someone um, exploitative. Right. Uh, I think that the way that you treat people and your understanding of boundaries is what either encourages predators to be in your spaces or at least allows them to thrive in your spaces. Um, so I, you know, I, I make, um, I make, videos on YouTube very occasionally. But when I was doing it more regularly, I was talking about like FOSTA and SESTA. Mm -hmm. And FOSTA and SESTA is something I want to get into in a second as well. Um, but, you know, I would talk about those things. And I remember someone was like, well, how would you feel if your husband went to a sex worker? And I was like, I don't know. Did he tip? Was yeah. he nice? <laughs> was he nice? He... Yeah. Did, did he, he pay did he well? Immediately, yeah, did he pay well? Did he immediately, like, pull out condoms? I mean, like, I, I don't know. How did he treat the sex worker? That's the only yeah, thing I care matters, about in this yeah. situation. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I just, it's also this idea that, like, once we hit socialism, uh, sex work is going to go away. And it's like... Yeah, there's going to be more of it. <laughs> it's just going to be a different context. Gonna, well yeah i don't well, think it's don't you think away. too that there's like a there's another thing that people overlook which is like um there's this there's this like uh there's like all this stuff where it's like oh there's inherent power imbalances in in sex work because it's like you know men with money and, and privilege paying women who don't have money and privilege there's an inherent you know imbalance but then out of the other side of their mouth they they don't actually advocate or advocate explicitly against the very things that would help even that power imbalance out by giving power to sex workers giving legal protection giving uh you know personal protection giving societal protection like like i mean i look at like okay so one such example if we want to touch on like a on a policy imagine how the world would change overnight if if we had like a ubi that made it so that sex workers who are currently doing sex work but don't want to they're doing it out of necessity have a ubi instantly you, the sex work industry is going to have a big change because people no longer have to do that if they don't want to and then all of a sudden you have a new paradigm and nobody talks about those aspects of it they just instead fixate on this like almost hypocritically individualistic moral calculus of like whether it's good to participate in the in the in the back and forth and it's like well you do you do that for everything that you participate in society why do you fixate so much on this and yeah i mean working working as a waiter or working as a bartender making two dollars an hour while uh my manager goes into the cash register and takes money out of my tips mm -hmm. to pay for the things being fixed at the bar like I'm sorry, you're not saying that bartending needs to go away. Like, work in a capitalist society is inherently exploitative. Like, it just is. So this is something that, like, I have to, I feel like I'm constantly having to mention to people where I'm like, your problem is not with sex work. Your problem is with power imbalances and power dynamics. And there is a way to change that. It's not an inherent part of having a sexual experience with another person. It's an inherent part of work in the system that we currently have at the moment um like yeah. i mean and, and to touch on that real quick as a broader point um the idea that like like we we all sell our bodies under capitalism all of us every last one of us and if you don't believe that there is not a parallel between somebody who who sells their body for porn or sells their body for stripping or whatever and someone who sells their body to be used as 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 basically a a mule to carry all kinds of heavy luggage at, in front of jet engines where you could easily be injured in the in an instant you don't think there's any parallels whatsoever between those two different slightly different forms of selling your body like it's just an absurd the, the, it, it, it's almost emblematic of the way that our society views it that this is siloed off as like oh this is a unique form of selling your body no we all do this we all sell our bodies and our minds and our talents that's that's part of the reason why we talk about all this stuff so much sure and you know I, I, this is one of the reasons why like when people who don't 
you know, I, I will say that there's like a unique component, I think, um, mm -hmm. to sexual experiences for some people. And I don't want to pretend like that doesn't exist, mm -hmm. um, especially, you know, I've worked in so many different parts of the industry. Um, but I will say that there's also an emotional component to like working in food service because I worked in food service for a long time. Um, and I remember being so fucking disrespected working in food service, so fucking disrespected uh, working in bars. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's also like, like if I don't understand if you want to liberate women, how you could talk shit about um, moving in a direction like OnlyFans. Like yeah. if, unless you're telling me specific things about OnlyFans, like, okay, um, OnlyFans takes 20% and I don't think that's right, or OnlyFans um, caps the amount of money they'll give a sex worker based off of referrals after like $50,000, or um, the way that they have sort of like screwed up the payment processing, but it's never specific things like that. It's always yeah. like OnlyFans bad because it's pushing young women into... Um, exploiting themselves for men and it's like no it's not the on the website only fans is not pushing women into doing that it's providing them an avenue through which to make money independently on their own and if you really think that porn is bad i never want to hear you criticize the concept of only fans right. because i would much rather hop over on my bed and film myself oiling up my feet then work for an agent who's going to put their hands in my fucking pockets who's going to take five ten whatever percent who's going to put me in a studio with a man that i don't know telling me i'm going to do a girl girl scene and then when i get there they say Actually, you're going to do a boy-girl scene, and for an extra $200, you're going to do anal. And if you don't want to do that, fuck you. Find your own way back to Texas. By the way, don't bother showing up to the hotel room we paid for for you because you're not staying in it unless you let this stranger fuck you in the ass when you thought it was going to be a girl you were filming with today. Yep. Like, really, sit here and tell me which one do you think is better. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's, it's like, really, really frustrating for me that we have these conversations around, like, is the industry good or bad instead of how do we put more power in the hands of the workers? Yeah, um, it's almost because... like it would be like, I don't know, it would be like uh, it would be like like criticizing streaming as a concept on a moral level instead of saying like hey it's actually kind of fucked that there's only two streaming companies and both of them lock people into massive contracts that are ridiculously exploitative and take like more than 50 percent of the income that those people go out and grind for every single day like instead of talking about that let's just say oh streaming is bad yeah yeah um, and this is the thing that gets me is like the people that, that talk about the industry. Um, if, if a lot of the people that I saw hating on the industry had, um, actual like inside valid critiques of the industry, I would feel completely differently, but it's mm -hmm. so very, very, very rare that I see someone who goes, Hey, listen, um, the porn industry that's in, you know, based in Cal mostly in California, like a lot of these big studios, yeah, yeah. these are bad. And what we need is unions for porn workers. What we yeah. need is like uh, something like, uh, you know, protect federations or, or, or something. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so if I saw people saying things like that, then I would be like, that's an actual valid criticism. Like I'm, you know, as someone who works in the industry and as someone who does porn for a living, I'll be the first one to tell you that I think the actual porn industry is disgusting and exploitative um, and harms women. So, yeah. you know, I do it in some ways understand where a lot of like, I think this is why I'm a bit more sympathetic than you are to some of the arguments against sex work, because I do think um, that, I think that people really have heard and seen some of the awful, awful things that happen inside of the professional porn industry. Like, I don't know if you guys know this, but um, I guess like maybe a week and a half ago or some, sometime last week, a clip was circulating of Lana Rhodes. Do you guys know who Lana Rhodes is? I'm not familiar off the top of my head, but... So Lana Rhodes did porn for like under a year, I think, but she was like one of the top names in the industry. She's this beautiful wow. like Instagram influencer now, um, but she talked about. Um, a lot of people do. Yeah. She talked about a scene that she had to do where um, 
someone did something really fucking disgusting and degrading to her and she she talks about in in you know on this podcast that she's in um about how some of the things that she's done she'll never be able to get over and no one could ever understand um and and it really like struck me and it really touched a nerve because um there were things that happened to me in the strip club that you know you're trying to talk to a therapist about and like they just don't understand Mm -hmm. and there's also like it kind of relates back to like some of the stuff that happens to me online too where it's like you know how i i've just started like recently going to therapy because um i was diagnosed with ptsd in february uh january of february but um it there's just like things that can happen to you surrounding sex and sex work and being known as a sex worker that i don't think most people can relate to or identify with and Mm -hmm. they can't understand and you know she was like there are things i'll never be able to forget um and i sometimes feel like um the way I've been treated online, like in regards to my body, in regards to my work, um, that I've, I feel like I've been publicly violated at times. Yeah. Um, that's the, the closest thing that it, it feels like it, like I'm walking well, around with like a scarlet letter or something. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can completely understand why you would feel that way. Like, like that's, I, to me, that's, a, that's like a, a, preeminently rational conclusion to come to when when your life has over the course of like a a couple of months gone from being like a regular level of social media attention to suddenly a a huge uh, thousands of people on the internet are trying to frame you for being the nashville bomber or or telling you how you're the worst person and they're just applying scrutiny to your life and they're going through your personal pages and snapping everything and criticizing how you you know your joke about noodles and like it's it, that is that is a form of violation it's very very invasive it's so out of line and it's it's yeah you're completely justified in in feeling that way i would i would say that's like very rational and i it surprises me how few people take the time to think about like how their actions can contribute to that sort of thing um and also like i i find it strange how people will treat uh, the the porn industry and the workers therein and, and people who participate in it and people who partake in it as a sort of um, unique evil when like again like there's a lot of there's a lot of dirty secrets in in nearly every industry right like and yeah there are some that are pretty intense and worse than others but like I remember why I left sales and sales isn't isn't like even nearer to the degree of of precarity that is often in get involved in in sex work but it was because of very similar reasons just on a, on a less intense level people I would break down crying all the time on my job because and this was specifically true after I transitioned because the way that I was treated in that industry was so demeaning. And I was, I was supposed to be like this, like, like demure thing that doesn't look out for my own interests. And just as like, you know, takes everything on the chin from people who are screaming, grown men screaming in my face because some minor thing went wrong with their crappily done online, um, you know, rent, you know, rental or whatever. And it's just like, what the fuck? And like, and, and and people will look the other way on this and and or or they'll they'll have some knowledge of it and then they look at porn and they go nah we need to like destroy this industry instead of actually helping the people who are working in that industry which is such an like an ass backwards approach to it I, I don't know yeah um I think this is really true of all service industry and you know I think that this is kind of something that a lot of people don't understand. Um, yeah. I think of sex work as like a service industry position. Mm-hmm. And in some ways, um, you have more flexibility than you would in, uh, you know, a lot of other service industry positions. But like, that's my background. Yeah. I started working service industry when I was like 15, I think. So for 12 years now, I've, I've done customer service jobs. Mm-hmm. Um, and and you should have more freedom and you should have more control in the sex industry than you would have like working at a cashier's 
you know, working as a cashier yeah. at, at McDonald's or waiting tables or serving drinks or whatever. But yeah. it's still that sort of same thing where, like, there's so much abuse that you you endure while you work in the service industry. Mm -hmm. And so I think instead of, like, you know, moralizing or instead of, like, straight victimizing the people in the industries we should be asking ourselves how do we make this better yeah. like we should be having conversations about like how do we keep brothels from taking 50 percent of the earnings from the the yeah. people that work in them the women that work in them um i don't know if you guys know this but if you work in a brothel in nevada the last that i heard um, there's brothels out there that'll take, first of all, they make you supply everything, all of your condoms, all of your lube, um, you know, all of your own, like, obviously all, all of your own clothes, but like any like, uh, toys or anything that you need, um, tissues, like anything to make your customers more comfortable inside of your little room that you're assigned or whatever. First of all, you have to front all of that. Um, and then they also turn around and take 50% of the money you make. And then, of course, they report your income to the IRS as well, who then takes another, I don't know, what, 30. 20 to 34%. Yeah. Depending, because um, you're self-employed contractor. Yeah. 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 And you have to account for all of that. They don't help you with your taxes because you're, you know, you're not getting a W-9 or a W-4 or whatever. You're a 1099. Um, so you're just, fuck you. You're on your own. Figure it out, you know, and... I think that like there's a lot of um, financial literacy that people in the industry would really greatly benefit from. Mm -hmm. um, there's no like like on the job training or like life skills provided to people who work in our industry. Um, and I, there is a lot of exploitation, but I don't think that the answer is trying to create a black market yeah. where women will find themselves in more and more dangerous places with less resources and less help and shadier and shadier people willing to engage in those black market services. I think the answer is like, how do we provide educational services? Um, you know, how do we, um, how do we get collective bargaining power? How, how do we um, sort of put play, like checks in place for people who run strip clubs, people who uh, run brothels, that sorts of thing? Um, and, and I would really like to see the voices of sex workers amplified more because as it is, like, I think there's a reason why a lot of sex workers don't talk about politics online. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of them don't want to end up like me. Yeah. And oh, or, I or, you know, other people who've been in your position because, you know, like it happens a lot. I've talked about this so goddamn much on my channel. And I, I'm sure you know that you've probably seen some of my segments on it talking about how um, disposable people treat. And, and mostly when I talk about it, because it's kind of my wheelhouse, I talk about trans women um, at, who usually have. Uh, not even always doing work that's particularly sexual, but a lot of times that is the fixation. I mean, I've talked about my friend who's a writer who was literally just driven off of Twitter by years of hate um, from just talking about sex online, just writing about it. You know what I mean? Um, and then, you know, we have examples like the, the I, I bring up Black Dresses frequently, a band that, you know, was very, very popular, incredibly influential, you know, small niche, but well known in, the, in their niche and incredibly influential in that way. Um, they they broke up because th they they were jumped on by this like crowd of people who were in a moral panic over them writing a song about their experience with abuse as a child and because it was sexual in nature they decided to swing that into oh this is like advocating for something and it's just ridiculous that level of scrutiny being placed unfairly it, it is it is untenable and it also leads to silencing of the people who most need to be talking about these things and um you know, I, I, I can't help but find myself thinking like, damn, we need to figure out a way to, to, to like coordinate and find a bunch of like uh, sex workers who've succeeded who could make like a, a co-op brothel. Like or something like that that doesn't have these these uh, these overhanging, highly exploitative um, structures and whatnot. But again, those those whole projects are always very hard. And uh, I can I could say it's difficult to, to organize things uh, like that that are like because nobody's done it before. The the uh, the the solutions of the past don't necessarily apply to the gigified future. You know, we don't have. 
you know, a union doesn't necessarily apply to a bunch of independent contractors on OnlyFans or a bunch of independent contractors on Twitch. You know what I mean? We have to come up with yeah. new ideas for a new era. And that's challenging. That's very hard. Um, but well, I just don't think that like, um, sorry, sorry. Uh, I'll just finish this thought. Uh, I don't no, yeah, think course, that like course. that ML people, um, that, that are like jumping on this anti-sex and it's not all MLs, but the anti-sex bandwagon that we've been seeing this anti-sex worker bandwagon, not, you'll notice none of it is actually, like you said before, none of it is fixated on actually building a solution. It's just condemning one industry or condemning an individual as opposed to saying what actual thing could we build that would alleviate the problems we're talking about yeah yeah um you know it's interesting there was an attempt in san francisco at i believe it was called the lusty lady um the workers came together and mm -hmm. they bought they bought the club um mm -hmm. and they ran it on their own for for a little bit but i think that they ended up getting priced out um and, and that's the other thing is like so my home club closed and um for some like tax related stuff my home club closed and even asking questions about like okay like what if we all pull our money together and um what if we tried to buy the club it was like okay well the property is going to be worth at least three million dollars and then you're going to have to get um you know like a an adult or like a cabaret license and then you know there's only so many of those that they give out and yeah. then of course you're going to have to buy a liquor license and it's like okay okay all right all right yeah. okay cool <laughs> i get it and it's yeah. like okay that's going to be three thousand dollars for this license and then it's going to be like you know seven hundred dollars to apply for this permit and, and it, it it's so complicated and i feel like this comes back to you know there's not a lot of financial literacy information directed at sex workers yeah. and i think it would be incredible because strippers have the ability to make i mean enormous amounts of money mm -hmm. um and i think that if there was more information like I, I wish that I could do this, but I'm not even anywhere close to as financially literate as I want to be. Um, yeah. But I wish that there were like channels that were, were um, directed at being like, hey, don't buy that fucking Birkin bag. Yeah. Put your money in this sort of in like an index fund or like, I, I don't know, like ways to empower women to to get out of the industry if they want to. Um, or even just improve their position in the industry. Or, yeah. Improve yeah. their position or be able to have more bargaining power, because, mm -hmm. I mean, that's the other thing is like politicians don't care about us. Um, we're not like like legal issues that affect strippers and sex workers are not getting attention from politicians because we're not a voting block that matters. Yeah. Um, and this goes back to what I was talking about earlier with FOSTA and SESTA, where like legislation gets passed that really hurts us. And because we are the only ones who legitimately advocate for ourselves, not really a lot is happening like there's mm. so far there's a, a piece of legislation that i believe uh ro Khanna, bernie elizabeth warren and barbara hill maybe mm -hmm. i think is her name are are proposing that there is a study that looks into what fosta did yeah and it's like oh cool maybe we'll get a study at some point yeah. we all when we're all sitting here telling you that it's been terrible and that it's caused like death and harm and literally pushed women into the arms of traffickers and pimps for safety because they can now no longer use the internet right but you already know this but because it's yeah. just us advocating on our own behalf it, it's hard it, you know any any yeah. even idea of reform or, or getting rid of that law is, is happening at a snail's pace well, I will say that being willing, your willingness to discuss these issues so openly and, and so vulnerably is a part of the changing of that process, right? Educating people who are not part of a small, a small niche industry or but who might participate unknowingly or might not even, but educating them to the issues is the beginning of changing the culture on it. So... Um, I will take the as the as the as the host of the show, I will thank you personally for being willing to talk about these issues and educate all of these. What are we at now? Approximately just under 300 viewers right now. 
on this issue. So thank you for Incredibly that. Based. Are you cool with taking two quick questions before we wrap up? Because I do have a panel appearance that I got to go on in about 15 minutes. But if you've yeah. got a couple questions, um, yeah. actually, this one right I... here that Posadas John just brought up, it's overly complicated on purpose to keep it in the hands of the powerful and, and making it incapable for workers to handle it themselves, right? Yeah, yeah, I would say that's true for like many industries. I think it's especially true here. And now, Merrick, you can also uh, please weigh in on that as well. Um, overly complicated, you mean like in terms of uh, reviewing the legislation that's been passed or in terms of like actual ownership of a club? Oh, everything from how litigated it is to how much you have to, everything you need to purchase in order to even get into there. Like what you were talking about, how there's like three different licenses you need, all of which cost cash, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I, and I think it's also a really good way for the county to like milk money out of you while you're trying to set up um, a business. But there, there was a question that I saw that I wanted to ask and mm -hmm. it was uh, or that I wanted to answer. It was uh, what other sex workers are like publicly um, publicly talk about this sort of thing or that talk about politics. And um, Alexis, what is her name? She goes by intellectual media. Oh, I think. In, in, yeah, intellectual media. Yeah, intellectual Alexual media. media yeah, intellectual, yeah. Uh, her name. I think her I, name I is love Alexis. Her. But yeah. If you go on Twitter and you look for, let me type it in, intellectual media. Um, let me see how it's spelled. Yeah, I've Maybe I've been reading a lot of her posts lately. Actually, she posts about a lot of good stuff. Yeah. Um. Somebody can somebody grab the um. The link, the Twitter link. There we go. Here Gay Fesh has got it. Yeah, Lectual. Yep. Uh, um, she has two yeah, channels. But, yep. But she's at Lectual. Um, that's her main account. And that's L E X U A L. And then I think two underscores. Um, but she talks about sex work from a uh, the perspective of a uh, black creator. She talks about feminism. She talks about intersectional feminism. She talks about black culture. She does a really, really great series on the 70s um, where she goes into like the history of, of things behind um, like the drug war, our current prison industrial complex. She's great. So you can learn a ton great. from her. Um, and she does like a like sex education stuff as well. So she's super, super cool. Yep, I agree. Um, so next question was, do you think the fact that OnlyFans is hitting the public consciousness, even if it's sometimes used as the butt of a joke, implies that there's a bit of changing public attitudes towards sex work or no? Yes. Um, so I started talking about being a sex worker openly online in 2014. Um, so I've been talking about this for a long, long time. And I've noticed definitely a change in the way that it's discussed, a change in the amount of acceptance for it. Like you never in 2014, 2015, like you never saw people being like pro sex work. You never saw that yeah. being a part of their politics. And now you do. And I think that that's really, really cool. Yep. And, and like I said earlier, when we were talking about, well, and like I said yesterday, like I tend to say almost every day, you get to be one of the people who chooses if you want to make take a position on this and talk to people about it when it comes up. This is why we do this. This is why we talk about it. Because the more people who choose to have an informed position on any of these major issues that we talk about on this show, you get to be part of that cultural change. That's how cultures change. Um, so next next question is... Uh, from Dandruff, I have a question for Merrick. When you explained your logic for your sexual mutual aid take, you said that sex work is one of the oldest forms of labor, and you cannot imagine it ceasing to exist in a post-capitalist reality. Would it not make sense that, th that this is the case because of all previous society's basis and monetary transaction? I'm curious about your take on that. Um... No, I mean, so I don't think it's because we've always had monetary transactions that that it would simply go away if we didn't have those. Um, and, and that's why I use the example of Gone Wild, because if we were to live in a society without money, um, I would still make porn because I think that it's really good for people to have like sexual outlets and sexual aids. Um, and I don't know, like I definitely have spoken with people who are like, yeah, you know, I think there's a lot of lonely people out there and I wouldn't mm -hmm. mind spending my time with people. Um, and, you know, you, you hear stories like a lot of people reached out to me when that happened. And one in particular that I still remember was someone being like, yeah, my best friend died. And when my best friend was dying, 
um, she was a lesbian. And so she met a sex worker and the sex worker would go spend time with her in her hospital bed. And like they got to know each other really well. And that sex worker was there with her until the very end when she died. Um, and I think that there are people who look at the idea of companionship in society and that see that there are a lot of really lonely people out there who do need care and who do need companionship. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that there are still people who would want to provide intimacy services for people. And I don't think that that would go away because we don't work for wages anymore. Yeah. And in fact, I think that like the destigmatize the destigmatization of of intimate work um, of one type would off would probably contribute to destigmatizing into like intimate work of other types. Um, you know, yesterday we talked about the um, huge issue in America of like basically old people just fading away after they reach a certain age because they just don't have anybody left specifically queer folks don't tend to have families that are accepting and so they tend to spend their later years alone and die young because they don't have anybody in their life and this is not necessarily something that would require the aid of a sex worker but a a visitor uh, uh who just is there to socialize with even if you pay them um, it could be something that could change everything. It could even just open the door to them making friends, having somebody that you could go like, hey, can I pay like a like a like an intimate escort to come with me to a social event so I'm not afraid and alone. I have somebody who will be with me the whole time and whatever could be massive, right? Like, yeah. 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 Well, so and, and one of the things that really um, inspired me when I was talking about this idea of it being a form of mutual aid was my own experiences in the club where, you know, one of my regular customers would come in and yes, I was in lingerie, but what we did was he would come in, he would get a VIP with me and I would sit on his lap and I would hold him and he would cry. And I would play with his hair and I would hug him and hold him. And that was what we did. Um, and I, it was really draining for me emotionally because I cared about him and because that's a, that's a fucking emotional service that you're providing for yeah. someone. Um, but I think that that was a good and valid thing to do. And I think that there are more people that need intimacy in that way. Yeah. And whether it's sexual intimacy, whether it's touch intimacy, people need this. And yeah. so that's why I was talking about it as a form of mutual aid. Um, yeah. And I think it really got misconstrued into like, 100%. oh, you think that the male orgasm is the most important thing and men need to have orgasms. And it's like, no, men need fucking intimacy and women need intimacy, too. And non-binary people need intimacy. Everyone is so fucking isolated yep. that we need this. And I think that in a post-capitalist society, people will still need it. Of course they will. I, I agree with you, by the way. I think that like, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I don't know if I can choose which of your cancellations is the most ridiculous, but that's got to be one of the most bad faith, like horrible interpretations of what you were trying to say. And if you go back and look at what you actually said about it, most of the people reacting to it were just literally not even listening to what you were saying. Um, so did you see yeah. that I got canceled for, or that people say that I made a rape joke about joking about how ridiculous sexual mutual aid was? No, because the well, whole I didn't point of either. sexual mutual aid is that it's like offering like you know intimacy and care services mm -hmm. consensually for for like you know uh, without capitalism. So yeah. somebody made a meme where it was like it's the the UN the blue hats and then the guy with the gun. Have you yeah. seen that meme Yo, format I've seen that's that going meme. around? Yeah, have, yeah. So so someone made one making fun of people for saying that I was advocating for rape. And it was like, it was my face. And it was like, come in, it's time for your mandatory sexual mutual aid. And the guy was like, I'm Volcel, no, I'm Volcel. So the whole point was like how fucking ridiculous it was to take that in bad faith. Um, and so I was like, oh my God, that's super fucking funny. And I posted it. And a bunch of people in my community were like, okay, that's super fucking funny. The, obviously, the whole joke is that it literally cannot possibly be rape because it, it just – these two ideas are not compatible. Right. Um, and then I realized, oh, shit, people who don't know the lore, that's not going to be, like, funny. So I deleted it. And, I, you know, I, I made a whole thread where I was like, hey, you know, I realized that if you don't know the background information that – it probably looks weird. This is not what I meant. This is what I meant. This is the whole story. My bad. I shouldn't have posted that. It should have been in like a Discord or something. And now people are like, Merrick was advocating for rape. And I'm like, 
Of, you have you have fucking... so much you have so much patience for people on the idiot on the internet. I almost just on the idiot on the idiot, but um uh, for idiots on the internet um and I I have to say it's it's respectable, um but I don't know how you do it because my response would have been to take a bite of my food and go like this and then never talk to any of them ever again. But um but yeah, I, well, yeah I just am so block happy at this point. So it's good, just that's the way it should be. It. Yeah, that's the way it yeah. should be. Well, I have to uh, head off and go grab a drink before I go on a panel where we're going to be debating about IP law um, and vaccine uh, freedom. Um, but thank you, Merrick, so very, very much for coming on. Um, if you want to shout out uh, your YouTube channel and other um, non-TOSable things that you can shout out because we're on Twitch as well, um, do that. Uh, if, please go forward with that, and then uh, and then we'll wrap up. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for having me on. I, I love coming Anytime. on your show. It's always um, a pleasure. It's always so nice to talk to you. You have the nicest community. Um, thank you guys for being so sweet and kind always. Um, I am. I have a friend. Her name is Eldritch Mother on Twitter. So you could follow her. Damn, I like your branding. Um, yeah, you could follow her. And then I am Merrick DeVille on Instagram youtube uh any other particular website uh and then on eldritch mother's twitter she has a link in her bio that will conveniently take you to all of my online presence places amazing what a great friend mm -hmm. um what a very great friend thank you again so much for coming on being willing to share everything that you had to say and and educate my audience further on a very very important issue today has been a big learning day and i imagine it's going to be even more learning uh soon uh thank you again so much merrick and of course as always much love to you i always love talking with you anytime you hit me up we'll make it happen okay thank you bye, bye. good luck on your panel thank you bye bye for now yay that was such a good call that was such a good call. Okay, I got to figure out. Hold on.